Okay, uh, thank you so much to everyone for attending. Let's get started with today's session. Uh, slide two, please. So welcome to our fifth regional plan review virtual Q&A. Uh, today we're gonna be discussing trans uh, mobility and the regional plan. My name is Kathleen Frelick and I'll be moderating today's session. I'd like to inform our attendees that this event is being recorded and will be post and we will be posting it on the project website, which is www.shapeyourcityhalifax.ca slash regional dash plan. Slide three, please. So before we begin, I'd like to give everyone some quick instructions for using Microsoft Teams. Uh, first of all, if you'd like to use closed captioning for today's session, please click the CC button on the lower right hand corner of the screen. Slide four, please. Uh, you may leave the session at any time by clicking the leave button in the upper right corner of the screen. The link to the session will remain active throughout the event, so you are welcome to return if you would like. Slide five, please. So the main goal of this event is to answer your questions and gather feedback. You can submit questions and comments throughout the session using the chat screen to the right of the presentation and clicking ask a question. Slide six, please. So the minutes of this session will form part of the public record and you're welcome to include your name with your question if you would like, but you may also post anonymously by clicking post as anonymous. Slide seven, please. Uh, so once you've done all that, you may type your question in where it says ask a question and we will direct the question to uh, our panel of contributors. Um, so slide eight, please. Today, staff will provide a quick presentation regarding how mobility is being considered through the ongoing regional plan review and our team of HRM staff who have contributed to this section will be available to answer your questions. In addition to this session, we invite you to visit the project website and to participate in our other engagement tools, including our survey. You're also welcome to submit any other comments or questions by email or by phone. Uh, we'll be gathering public feedback until July 16th. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'll pass uh, things over to Leah Perrin, who is our principal planner with regional planning, and she's going to be giving a short presentation. Thanks, Kathleen. My name is Leah Perrin. I'm a principal planner with regional planning. Uh, next slide, please. We're here today because we're reviewing the regional plan, which means we're evaluating our land use policies and making sure they represent the direction that council would like to set. We're contemplating how the municipality is physically organized and growing. We kicked off this phase of public engagement on May 20th at Community Planning and Economic Development Standing Committee, which is the primary advisory body for this work. Today's session is focused on mobility. Uh, slide 11, please. Now, just to take a step back and make sure everyone understands the regional plan, it is a strategic document. The first planning document that we adopted after amalgamation that provided a regional-wide vision for land use. It was first adopted in 2006 and provided a comprehensive outline of how growth and development should take place until 2031. Slide 12. The regional plan is a powerful document in guiding the municipality's planning and decision making. At a high level, as a high level policy document, it does a few different things. First, the plan provides policy direction for planning at the regional and community level. The regional plan sits above the community or secondary plan level documents and above our land use bylaws and sets that region wide policy intent. Where something is important enough that it should apply everywhere, the regional plan policy can set up land use bylaw regulations that will be applied region wide. This has been done most often for our environmental regulations. So, for example, for setbacks from water courses, these policies sit in the regional plan and then the regulations are rolled out in every community's land use bylaw. It can establish the municipality's intent to do future research programs or studies. For example, the 2006 regional plan called for a series of transportation priorities plans, including a road network plan, which ultimately became the integrated mobility plan. With its adoption, there's ongoing work related to that plan that will get its own direction in the regional plan. And finally, the regional plan identifies where there are needs for different types of programming or opportunities to partner with community or other levels of government. Our mobility network is managed by different levels of government and can be supported through partnerships with other groups across our community. For example, the regional plan supports the Rural Transit Funding Program, which provides grants to community-based transit services in our rural areas. Slide 13. <coughs> 
This presents the progression of the regional plan over the past 15 years. In 2006, we approved the re original regional plan, and in 2014, we conducted our first review. You might recognize the name RP plus five, which was the brand for that review. You can see we're aiming to complete this review in 2022. Next slide. The Aims and Directions document was recently released, and it outlines the key ideas and planning issues that we will address in the review. It is a chance to step back and ask everyone, do we have this right? Are we headed in the right direction? The feedback we receive will help to focus our uh, work for the remainder of the review. Slide 15. The themes and directions document includes 11 themes. An overview of each theme is available to you on our website, shapeyourcityhalifax.ca slash regional dash plan. Today, we will be focusing on content in themes one and four. Theme one focuses on our role in enabling growth across the region, and theme four focuses on mobility. The municipality recognizes that transportation and land use planning are inseparable and the decision making process for both must be integrated. Uh, slide 16. There are a few key questions we're trying to answer through the review. The first is, how do we locate housing and employment in smart strategic locations so that growth can happen easily and in a way that furthers the municipality's most important goals? Next slide. We can break this down into two key questions. First, how are we growing? We need to evaluate the projected demand for housing and employment today and into the future. To do this, we're relying on two key pieces of information, our housing and population analysis and our industrial and employment land analysis. The second question we ask is where should growth go? Once we know how much we're going to grow, we begin to assess where new housing and jobs can be accommodated. It isn't only about where there are pieces of land that can be developed, but where that land is located as it relates to the location of services and infrastructure. We think about how and where we can infill and where we should expand the city into greenfill areas. This is done with careful consideration as to how development can be serviced with water, sewer, transit, recreation, and studying how we should be preserving or protecting important pieces of ecological or cultural land. And as Regional Council has identified aspirations for a sustainable future, such as the Integrated Mobility Plan, Mobility Plan's mode share targets and the emission reduction targets in Halifax, we can update our mo modeling and assess how different land use growth scenarios might interact with these long-term objectives. Slide 18. The regional plan set growth targets for where new housing should be located. The 2014 regional plan identified that 75% of new housing units should be located inside the regional center and suburban communities with at least 25% in the regional center. When we completed the foundational work for the center plan, it identified that the regional plan could accommodate up to 40% of new growth. Following that in 2017, the integrated mobility plan looked in further detail at the growth targets and assessed our ability to meet our mode share targets, which aim to increase how often residents walk, cycle, roll or take transit and decrease our reliance on private vehicles. That plan suggested that in order to meet our mode share targets, we need to locate as much growth as possible within the service boundary. So the integrated mobility plan assumed that the center plan would meet its 40% target, that 50% growth would be achieved in suburban areas inside the service boundary, and only 10% growth would occur outside the service boundary. On the right, you can see how we've performed against these growth targets in the past six years. 31% of new units were built in the regional center, 54% in suburban communities and 15% in rural communities. Slide 19. The Integrated Mobility Plan or IMP contains a region-wide vision for mobility and directs future investment in transportation demand management, active transportation and the roadway network and transit. Since the IMP represents a significant shift in the municipality's approach to transportation, um, the, the movement of people rather than vehicles is at the heart of the plan. Since the plan's adoption in 2017, a team of staff across municipal departments has been working to move the IMP's actions forward. Our work on the regional plan review will be instrumental in making sure that our region-wide mobility policies are consistent with that plan. We'll update the transportation and mobility chapter of the regional plan to reflect the policies and actions of the IMP and its regional approach to transportation planning. We'll also set policy intent in the regional plan for future work that we intend to do as the city grows. This will involve many different actions, and I'll talk about a few of them in detail on the following slides. Slide 20. 
Some roads across the region have been identified as strategic multimodal corridors. These are important transportation connections for moving people and goods, be it by vehicle, transit, or active transportation, which means walking, using a mobility device, or cycling. These corridors have been identified in the Moving Forward Together Plan, Active Transportation Priorities Plan, and the IMP, and we're further refined in the rapid transit strategy. We will update regional plan policy to identify strategic multimodal corridors that connect communities. This means we'll include policy direction to guide future functional plans for these corridors and direct land use along these corridors so that it supports our mobility objectives. We'll also set up a study of land acquisition tools, which will help us in preserving and acquiring rights of way for investments in these corridors and help in guiding a land acquisition strategy. Slide 21. In May 2020, Regional Council approved the Rapid Transit Strategy, which aims to build a rapid transit network by 2030. This strategy builds on the vision of the Integrated Mobility Plan, aiming to improve sustainable transportation options and better support population growth. It directs investment in high quality transit service and infrastructure, a key to improving residents' mobility and building more sustainable, affordable, and equitable communities. The proposed Bus Rapid Transit, or BRT, network consists of four fixed-route bus lines, which will provide all-day service, including 10-minute frequency from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. BRT lines will have fewer stops than local routes to reduce travel times. BRT will improve freedom of movement around the municipality, complementing local and express bus routes and increasing access to employment for many residents. The Rapid Transit strategy also proposes three new ferry routes, each connecting a new terminal to downtown Halifax. To create sustainable, transit-oriented, complete communities, the municipality is aligning our land use policy and rapid transit by planning for higher density, mixed-use development around existing and planned stations and terminals, working to ensure that affordable housing and amenities are available nearby, and improving local street connectivity and active transportation infrastructure. Slide 22. As I mentioned earlier, the regional plan and the integrated mobility plan directs that most growth should be located where there are existing services. To achieve the IMP's mode share targets, we know that we have to locate most housing and jobs where people can easily access the frequent transit network. During the rapid transit strategy, we looked at so-called uh, walk sheds of 800 meters with the expectation that people that live and work within 800 meters of a rapid transit stop would be able to easily access the network and we explored how we could update our land use policy to encourage new housing and jobs to locate around the rapid transit network. We've continued this work during the regional plan review. The map on this slide is a part of our scenario planning from our population and housing analysis, and it shows the BRT walk sheds and some preliminary ideas about how growth could happen in these areas. As we update our land use policies for suburban areas, which are those areas outside the regional center, but inside the urban transit service boundary, We'll be making, uh, working to make sure that most growth is aligned with the transit network. Slide 23. Momentous social and technological changes from virtual work to autonomous vehicles are transforming how people move around cities. The long-term implications of these changes for transit and land use patterns are uncertain. In this context, it's vital that a long-term vision for transit, including rapid transit, be considered together with a long-term vision for land use as travel behaviors continue to change. The Regional Plan Review offers an opportunity to set up future study of additional rapid transit corridors or areas that may be suitable for rapid transit expansion once the proposed network is implemented. The Regional Plan Review will establish the framework for a long-term study and envisioning process for land use and transportation beyond 2031. Slide 24. And finally, the regional plan has an important role to play in our work towards making HRM a city for people of all abilities, ages, and backgrounds. When we're talking about mobility across the region, accessibility is one of the most important considerations. Our planning and development regulations address a wide range of physical accessibility issues, including access to buildings, the design of the buildings themselves, how our streets and sidewalks are organized, the location of barrier-free parking, signage, and wayfinding, etc. Our strategic planning can also support accessible active transportation routes, accessible taxi services, and accessible transit. Our planning policies can support how we run our public engagement activities in an inclusive and accessible way, and direct that we partner with community to learn from others' experiences and help to improve the work we do and the services we deliver. Through the Regional Plan Review, we'll be reviewing our planning documents to make sure that they're aligned with the goal of bringing HRM closer to being a city for people, people of all abilities, ages, and backgrounds. 
Regional Council recently approved the accessibility strategy and the regional plan will support that ongoing work. Uh, next slide, please. To learn more, ask questions, join the project's mailing list and make your voice heard, please visit our website at shapeyourcityhalifax.ca slash regional dash plan or email us at regionalplan at halifax.ca or please call us at 902-233-2501. And I'll turn it back over to Kathleen now. Thank you. Great, thanks Leah. Um, next slide, please. So as we mentioned, um, this will move into the Q&A portion of the of the session. Um, we invite all of our attendees to ask questions through the chat function to the right of the present presentation screen by clicking ask a question. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I'll be reading all of the questions that we receive in the order that they are received and direct them to uh, our panel for responses. Um, for everyone's information, I'll remind you that the session is being recorded and will be posted on uh, Shape Your City, as well as a transcript of all of the questions and, uh, and the responses that we have uh, provided. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just quickly introduce our panelists who are here to help answer any questions that you may have. Uh, first is Tanya Davis, who is the Pro Program Manager for Strategic Transportation Pr Planning here at HRM. Uh, Aaron Blay, who is the Supervisor for Service Design and, Design and Projects with Halifax Transit. Dave McIsaac, who is our, the Supervisor for Active Transportation with Transportation and Public Works. Kate Green, who is the Program Manager for our Regional Policy Program. Uh, and Leah Perrin, who is our Principal Planner for the Regional Policy Program, uh, both of whom are working with the Regional Plan Review. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, everyone is welcome to submit comments and questions through the chat function. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to ask a few questions of my own just to sort of get the conversation started. Um, I'm, I think the first question is likely for Aaron. Um, I was wondering if you could provide us with some additional information regarding the Rural Transit Funding Program. Certainly, that would uh, be my pleasure. My name is Aaron Blay. I'm the Supervisor of Service Design and Projects at Transit. Um, so the Rural Transit Funding Program was approved in 2014 and Regional Council um, identified a need uh, through the Regional Plan approval that uh, would help the municipality to support not-for-profit organizations that were providing transportation services for members of um, the HRM community where Halifax Transit Service uh, isn't operating and, you know, maybe doesn't doesn't really make a ton of sense. So through the Rural Transit Funding Program, um, it's a grants program through which rural transit operators can apply for funding to subsidize the cost of operating their service within HRM. So in order to qualify, an organization has to be providing in a service that's not kind of competing with Halifax Transit Service. So generally in the rural area or like outer urban area um, that it's available to the public and that it's a not for profit. So grants are awarded to approved organizations in two ways. So one is a lump sum payment um, and that's either five or ten thousand dollars per year. And then after that, for every in-service kilometer that they report to us, they are paid 50 cents per kilometer. So for example, um, just kind of off the top of my head, last year, even with the pandemic, um, through this program, we paid out nearly a quarter of a million dollars to four service providers in HRM. So I think that the, one of the really cool parts of that program is that since it is areas outside of um, the Halifax Transit Service area, it's likely that a large percentage of the trips that are being made on those services um, wouldn't have been made if these, these organizations weren't available. Great, thanks so much, Erin. Um, so in the presentation, there was some discussion around complete streets. And so this question is probably largely uh, for uh, the whole panel, but largely for Tanya Davis. Um, how is the municipality working to design complete streets? Thanks for the question. Uh, Tanya Davis, Program Manager for Strategic Transportation Planning. So as part of the IMP, one of the foundational policies was complete streets. Um, and over the last number of years, we've, cr we've created a complete streets checklist that 
as our capital projects come up, we look at each project um, through a complete streets lens. So how can we adapt the street to be more uh, user friendly for all ages and abilities? I think it's important to also, so as we go through that, we try to adapt the streets to, to accommodate that. It's also important to note um, that not all streets will be complete for all users. So some streets will have certain priorities for different users. Um, so it, it's a great, great way to, to make sure that we're, we're looking at how to accommodate people as they move through our streets. Great, thanks so much, Tanya. Um, so our first question, I believe, is probably for Aaron. Um, once the rapid transit system is completed in 2030, will the RTS lines all have dedicated bus lanes for the entire route or at least a significant portion? Certainly, I'm um, happy to answer that question. So as was mentioned in the presentation, the rapid transit strategy was approved uh, spring of last year and the proposed bus rapid transit network or BRT network includes four fixed route bus lines that will operate all day, seven days a week with uh, at least 10 minute frequency from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So to answer the specific question, that was just to give a little bit of background. Um, the rapid transit strategy estimates that approximately 60% of the BRT network will have um, dedicated lanes that's subject to functional and detailed design. 60% um, is a, a pretty good chunk. That's not to say that the rest of the network, the other 40% wouldn't have, um, you know, signal priority or something like that. And also, you know, that would be kind of the, the starting phase. I think we would also be looking to extend beyond that 60% as well. Great, thanks, Erin. Um, so our next question, and again, I encourage all of our attendees to submit any questions that they may have using the chat function, but our next question is a uh, great presentation. You mentioned how HRM will be focusing new development uh, of homes and jobs around existing transit and BRT infrastructure. I strongly agree, but how will this be accomplished? Much of this area has already been developed. Uh, thank you for your consideration. I think this is probably for the entire panel, so um, I'll just let everybody jump in if they have any thoughts. Sure, maybe I'll start. Kathleen, it's Kate here. So thank you for the question. That's a great question. Uh, so when we did the rapid transit strategy, we actually studied in our suburban areas in particular uh, the opportunities for redevelopment along those corridors. So we looked at things like the age of buildings, uh, the size of properties that were directly adjacent to the corridor, as well as underutilized sites like parking lots. Where do those exist? And explored what the opportunities are to infill in such a way that we can sort of begin to um, transition those corridors and the um, densities that are along those corridors. Um, so when we set our planning policy through the regional plan, one of the things we'll be working with council on is what do we want those corridors to look like? What's the scale of building? How many people do we want to lo locate along those corridors in order to support rapid transit? And there's lots of work out there around um, what level how many people you need to put in close proximity to those corridors in order to support uh you know transit and high frequency transit in particular and the idea is that as people move to those corridors and start living in those corridors they don't actually have to commute by car they can use the transit system to get around um in in the city um and make a different a different mode mode choice The only thing I might add to the case um, comments is the region. The reason that we focused uh, that work on the suburban areas is that we have the uh, the regional center plan. The center plan process has has already looked at where um, growth will go in the regional center. And um, Kate was also mentioning these sort of density targets uh, of um, you know what level of development you need in order to support this rapid transit and in in the regional center we're actually we have a lot of places that already will support that transit so um our our future work is more in areas where we haven't done that additional uh, research and then it will support our, our future regulations
Great. Uh, thanks so much, Kate and Leah. Um, I don't see any additional questions from our participants, but um, certainly I'll, uh, I have some more questions that we can uh, give everyone some time to ask. Um, so uh, probably mostly for Tanya and, uh, and Aaron, what are the BRT routes and ferry routes included in the rapid transit strategy? Turning on my camera there. <laughs> so uh, sure, happy to answer that. So the rapid transit strategy included four fixed uh, route bus lines. So uh, we call those the purple line, the green line, the red line, and the yellow line. So uh, the purple line will travel between kind of Larry Utec. It's a crosstown route. So it starts on Larry Utec and goes all the way to Dartmouth Crossing. So it travels in Clayton Park via Dunbrack. Uh, through Bayers Road and Young Street, where uh, there's currently construction on um, transit priority lanes, uh, through North Street over the bridge, across Wise Road, and Commodore to terminate in Dartmouth Crossing. So that's the purple line cross town, kind of a little bit like the existing Route 3 in some ways. Uh, there's the green line, which will travel from Lacewood uh, all the way to the south end of the peninsula, kind of like the existing corridor route four. So it'll travel along Lacewood and Joe Howe uh, all the way along Roby Street, where we've also started to introduce transit priority, terminating at um, St. Mary's University. The red line uh, will be traveling in from uh, Dartmouth Coal Harbor, so from Portland Hills Terminal along Portland Street uh, over the bridge. You know, so through downtown Dartmouth and into downtown Halifax, over the bridge and uh, up Spring Garden Road to Dalhousie. And the last line is the yellow line. So that's connecting mainland south. So that starts on Greystone and travels along Herring Cove Road and to the peninsula and downtown via Connaught, uh, Quimpool, um, Spring Garden Road and Barrington. The three ferry routes um, are also part of the rapid transit strategy and all of them are planned to terminate at the Halifax Ferry Terminal now. So the three new routes are from Larry Utec, Mill Cove and Shannon Park. Great, thanks so much, Erin. Um, I have a quick question for our regional plan review team. Um, certainly we've been getting uh, questions around the, uh, the transit service boundary, and I'm just wondering if you can talk about how that boundary is being considered through the regional plan review. Sure, thanks Kathleen. So the urban transit boundary uh, essentially is where we run bus service um, and it is an important way that we organize growth and consider where we're going to infill or grow. Um, so often what the municipality does is we think about growing in areas um, where there are existing services. So where there are bus lines already, where there's pipe water, where there's pipe wastewater, that helps us to manage infrastructure efficiently, prevent it from sprawling and keep taxes low on the whole for our citizens and residents. Um, so when we review the regional plan, we take a look at our infrastructure boundaries, one of which is the transit service boundary, and we sort of study how our population has been growing, where we anticipate future demand to bring new land online will be, and um, check to see if there's a need to um, expand or adjust that boundary in order, in order to accommodate development or a growing population. So we're uh, about to start in on that exercise. Uh, we've just finished our population projections and are about to start in on those exercises now. Great, thanks so much. Um, I have a question about um, active transportation, so I'll direct it to Dave. I'm just wondering uh, if you could talk a little bit about some of the major active transportation projects that are either coming up or are currently underway. For sure. Um, so we've got, you know, we've got active transportation objectives across the municipality, you know, within the regional center. Uh, we do a lot of work in, in more kind of suburban communities. And uh, increasingly, uh, Council has asked us to uh, come back with, uh, and it's an action on the IMP for, for active transportation in rural HRM. 
Um, in the regional center, I mean, the regional center, for the most part, has, you know, historically has had uh, a very uh, good sidewalk network. So, uh, in, in, you know, in other parts of the municipality, we're playing catch up uh, in terms of building new sidewalks, but, but we're lucky uh, in the regional center, for the most part, that, that infrastructure is in place. Uh, the focus in the regional center right now is on building bicycle facilities that are safe and comfortable you know, we call for all ages and abilities. So really for people who, who don't bicycle now, um, for people who aren't comfortable riding in mixed traffic, and, uh, you know, that makes sense. You know, you, you know, if you're, uh, the technical term for, for a bicyclist in, in the engineering profession is the vulnerable road user because uh, you're not protected by, you know, uh, a ton or two of steel uh, and, and airbags and stuff like that. So what we need to do is engineer uh, and 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 design uh, the facilities so, so that they are safer. So what that means in the regional centre is on uh, busier streets uh, where we have facilities, we're putting in protected uh, bicycle lanes and doing work at intersections to uh, to make them safer. Uh, so, you know, what you will see around town right now are, are for example, on, on Hollis Street, uh, we've got, uh, uh, you know, a curb uh, and bollards to protect the, the bicyclists uh, from, from the vehicles. Uh, South Park Street, we now have protected bike lanes. Uh, one of the other facility types that has been quite successful in, in other places in North America and Europe are, are local street bikeways, sometimes called bicycle boulevards. So these are local streets that have um, not too much traffic uh, where we put in traffic calming measures and that, you know, connect, you know, offer that connectivity to from where people live to, to where they're traveling. Um, and in also a few multi-use pathways. So if you look, uh, for example, a big project for us now is to make a connection from the peninsula to uh, the western side, the western mainland, so Clayton Park, Fairview, those places. And and there's really, you know, it's it's not very well connected now. So as part of the Bears Road Transit Priority Project, we built a multi-use pathway, and uh, over the next year or two, you know, we're working to connect that uh, to the Chain of Lakes Trail that will connect, you know, up into um, neighborhoods and even to Lunenburg. <laughs> uh, so that gives you an idea of what we're doing in the regional center in more suburban communities. Uh, the focus is on a lot of multi-use pathways or trails. Um, and in rural HRM, we're looking at uh, some of those sort of more community centers and, and uh, often on provincial roads, but, but putting in uh, sidewalks, multi-use pathways there. So that's an overview. Uh, there's you know, information on the website and uh, if there's any more specific questions about, uh, about certain projects, uh, happy to um, answer those. Uh, Great, thanks so much. Um, so our next question is, I think probably a little bit for the whole panel, but I'll start with our regional plan review team. Um, looking at recent developments, there does not seem to be effective pathways to promote walkability. Does HRM have the ability to direct or advise developers on infrastructure layout? Also, could existing neighborhoods be retrofitted with pathways to promote walkability? I might take, I might uh, answer a part of that and, uh, you know, the answer is yes. You know, we work uh, in the transportation department quite closely with our colleagues in planning and uh, they involve us as, as development applications come in and, uh, and you know, we work to, um, to make them as, you know, walkable and, and connected as possible. I would say there's a challenge and, you know, this is, you know, something that, we talk about as we're doing these regional plans is is sometimes you know a development will get built, you know the developer will will as part of that um, you know put in the infrastructure for for walking sometimes bicycling, but then there's a disconnect between that and the rest of the network, and so we have these gaps and uh, and we don't have a whole lot of you know funding and resources to go in as a municipality to fill in those gaps. There's a lot more gaps than we have resources to. Um, to uh, to uh, to fill, so that's a challenge, um, and uh, we know where a lot of those are, and we're trying to kind of pick them off uh, as we can. But uh, it's certainly a, a challenge for us.
Great. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just going to add, I don't want to speak for our infrastructure planning colleagues, but I know that we are, um, you know, the uh, I think the question about advising developers on infrastructure layout, certainly through the subdivision process, um, we do have regulations around um, how street networks are laid out. Uh, there is an ongoing project to review what's called the, the municipal design guidelines or red book um, that will take more of a complete streets lens. Um, uh, the, I am not the, the expert on that, so I don't know whether Tanya or anyone else wants to, to add anything to that, but just thought I would mention it. Sure, I think uh, great points, Leah. Certainly, you know, our, our municipal guidelines uh, specifications are being updated and, and are coming back to council for kind of the next steps on that uh, in short order. The other thing that we've been working on too is uh, the traffic impact assessment guidelines, which is another tool in the toolbox that helps kind of start to speak to how development and the right of way interface uh, or interact. Um, so lots of work being done to, to continue to, to move that, that conversation forward and to make sure that we're getting good infrastructure builds. Um, so thanks for bringing that up. Great, thanks everyone. Uh, our next question I think is probably, well, it impacts everybody a little bit, so <laughs> I'll, I'll let you all uh, choose who wants to answer this, but uh, is HRM starting to think about autonomous vehicles and their implications in long range mobility and land use planning? We could see lots of lots more of this in 2031 and beyond. I can, I'll take a stab at that. Certainly, um, we are we are definitely thinking about autonomous vehicles. We know at some point they will certainly be here in Nova Scotia. Um, and I've been working with colleagues nationally on this topic and, and sit on a sit on a committee through our Transportation Association of Canada to to figure out what those impacts are, how we will deal with them, because it's not only autonomous vehicles coming, it's how we deal with them from an infrastructure perspective, right down to something as simple as how we paint our, our lines on our road in order to guide the, the vehicles. So certainly a, a big topic of conversation in, in the transportation uh, industry and certainly something that we're participating in um, at, a, at a national and international level. And I would say just to add to this, the, uh, this plan review, we're asking citizens uh, uh, and residents about their ideas in how we should planning for the long, how we should be planning for the long range, and what issues are important, and asking people to begin to imagine, you know, possible future states of our community, uh, so we can start to accommodate our rapidly growing growing population. Part of how we are thinking about this is that there are lots of different possible futures, lots of different scenarios. So how do we organize ourselves today to be able to respond to those possible futures as um, quickly as possible? How do we adapt? Uh, so part of that is putting our thinking caps on and thinking about what things, uh, future states might be most impactful to land use and planning and how our tr transportation system is organized. And certainly autonomous vehicles could be, uh, you know, a major technological change that could really change how we live. Um, so we're, we're wanting uh, everyone's input on that, not just our own. Great, uh, thanks everyone. Um, I think this pro pro uh, question would <laughs> be mostly for David, uh, but if anybody else wants to jump in, please feel free. Uh, it's great to hear that the priority for transit is in the suburb or in the suburbs will be existing existing areas where densification uh, will also be prioritized. How do you expect to help prioritize active transportation in these areas to increase walkability and meet community members' needs close to home in these areas and further reduce dependence on cars? Sure. So in more suburban communities, uh, we uh, are, I mean, I, some of the things we're doing is, is working to fill in the sidewalk gaps. So, uh, you know, some of those suburban communities are places where back in the day when they were built, the land use planning regulations didn't require sidewalks to go in. So we have a, you were playing catch up there. The focus when we put new sidewalks or active transportation infrastructure in those more suburban communities is to make those connections between where people live and where they access transit and, and where they may shop. Um, 
I think, you know, our suburban communities in Halifax, you know, have a bit of a reputation for being, you know, car centered and, and that sort of thing. But often when you look at the distances, you know, between where people live and where they could shop or, or access services or go to school, um, they're not that far. Um, and, and are, you know, very walkable and, and certainly bikeable. So it's, you know, it's about the infrastructure and, and making those connections and, you know, playing catch up and, and going back and, and filling in those gaps that, you know, are that weren't put in place in the beginning. Um, you know, one of the projects that, that we've started in the past uh, two or three years uh, that are very relevant to, to suburban communities are the street to street walkways that, that exist sort of behind people's houses. And, you know, often those, those facilities were put in when those communities were built and then haven't been rehabilitated since. So that's like, you know, 20 plus years uh, since. And, and what we see in those suburban communities is those end up being the, the you know, quite active for, for walking, uh, for, for kids getting to school, uh, that kind of thing. So we've been making steady progress over the past number of years uh, of rehabilitate, rehabilitating them, uh, making it possible for them to be cleared uh, from snow in the winter just uh, uh, by having a better quality uh, surface. Um, and uh, and you know we one of the things that we do have in our, our suburban communities for active transportation is a lot of community groups and you know Lower Sackville, Coal Harbor, uh, Spryfield community trails associations who really um, are are you know one are great advocates for active transportation in their communities and two have really actually done some of the work of of planning and and building and maintaining some of those facilities. Um, so active transportation really important we think in in suburban hrm and uh and there's some really you know there's some good projects happening and uh and from a mobility perspective uh it's really one of those those great integrated mobility stories where where uh getting people from their front door to the transit stop you know requires that active transportation infrastructure in the middle and uh and you know, working with uh, our colleagues in transit, we are picking those off and 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 uh, and making it more accessible and and more possible to to make those connections. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, Dave. Um, our next question is also probably for you, so don't go anywhere. Uh, are there any plans to install bike paths on Quimpool Road? As indicated, there is not much connection uh, in the east-west direction. Sure. So right now, the the plan for bike facilities east west and that part of the peninsula is to use those local street bikeway facilities. So um, you know, one block north of of Quinpool, we've got a segment of local street bikeway on Allen Street. Uh, this construction season, we're going to build a, a safer crossing of Oxford to to get over to Oak Street and kind of continue further west uh, and eventually cross Connaught. Um, and then on the south side of, of Quinpool, uh, we've got a local street bikeway candidate route on Norwood and, and Shirley. Um, we are looking at kind of the first block of Quinpool from uh, Roby up to uh, Vernon and Quingate. Uh, that is part of our, our midtown bikeway planning process. And I think that, you know, if there were to be bikeway facilities on Quinpool itself in the future, it would have to be kind of a part of a larger planning project, probably a complete streets planning project, looking at the overall functions and, and what we need to have on Quinpool from all those modes. Uh, but for now, what we're working on is, is those local street bikeway routes on either side of Quinpool. Great, thanks so much. Uh, I think our next question is probably for either Tanya or Aaron. Uh, transit infrastructure and plans seem to be focused on transporting people to and from the urban core, especially downtown Halifax. There are lots of gaps in the outer areas like Dartmouth, which will grow exponentially in the near future, uh, but does not have plans for to support transit in and between non-peninsula communities. Will there be any shifts uh, in focus towards inter-community transportation? Sure, um, I can start that one and Tanya, feel free to to jump in um, as you see fit. So I guess there's kind of two things here. So first is kind of transit by the nature of the service and the fact 
um, you know, that it's it's not super cheap to run, um, you know, we typically focus our service on the highest trip demand first with providing that with the highest level of service. So, you know, right now our service is very weighted towards those large employment destinations like downtown Halifax, like Burnside Dartmouth Crossing. And, you know, these areas also have the highest potential for increased demand. So what you would have seen in those rapid transit strategy routes, that's what those um, those routes are trying to address those huge those huge demand sort of pockets. Um, all that said, that doesn't include all of the other service that will be on the map, including local service, corridor routes, level of service, which can still be 10, 15 minute level of service, uh, other types of routes in the network, many of which will also be able to take advantage of the transit priority measures like those planned or in, in the works for Portland Street in Dartmouth or on Dunbar. So um, the purpose of these other route types, while they're not the same as bus rapid transit, now at least and they have the, always the potential to be upgraded to that in the future um the purpose of those routes is to bring people to locations where they can transfer to other route types and and make those really important connections um and they bring people to other locations where they can eat shop play go to school and work uh near near their own community so that they don't have to travel into uh the peninsula which you noted in your question um, so this describes kind of the hub and spoke style of network that was approved by regional council in the moving forward together plan. Hope that answers your question. Great, thanks so much. Um, and so this is the last question that we've received uh, from our attendees. Please feel free to submit additional questions if you'd like. We have about another 10 minutes, um, but uh, otherwise we can, you know, wrap things up. But our, our last question is for Tanya. Um, many cities are reducing their default speed limits on residential streets to 30 kilometers and 40 kilometers for safety purposes. Is this something that could be considered in the regional plan review? Great question. And I think, you know, we've had lots of questions around speed limits, or, you know, over the last little bit around, you know, how it is around road safety. So the way our provincial government is set up, we have a uh, motor vehicle act. Um, and in that it, it, it outlines the default um, speed limits um, and the default speed limit, the lowest speed limit that we can set currently is 50 kilometers an hour. However, we have been working, um, our road safety team um, in TPW has been working closely with our colleagues at uh, the provincial government through the traffic authority there to work on neighborhoods to, so we, we as a municipality have to put in an application to say, hey, we think this is a really good idea. We should lower these speeds. These speeds are higher than we would like to see on our residential streets. Can we work together and come up with a new default? And so I don't know how many um, neighborhoods and streets have had lower speed limits put in, but there's been quite a bit over the last little bit. Um, hoping to see more as we go through the process um, because we know it's, it's one tool in the toolbox to get slower speeds uh, on our street. Other tools um, that we've been looking at though through um, our road safety team is, is around traffic calming and bump outs and, and speed tables and speed humps, as well as you know, using the complete streets lens and guidelines to help you know, when we're designing streets, new streets or retrofits, that we're designing them for the speed in which it's intended. Because reducing speed limits is only one piece. Um, you know, there's all, all kinds of other pieces in the toolkit to do that. So I hope that answers your question. I was going to just add one little extra point to that. Um, it's a bit of a general point, but a lot of what we have, a lot of what we do with mobility in, in the municipality has to happen in the context of, of where the province, you know, you know, it's their legislation often that we have to use. Um, you know, we also, uh, the municipality owns a certain number of roads, but we've got a provincial highway system that, that surrounds us and, and, and that really impacts modal choice in the municipality. So, you know, looking at the regional plan, there, there are tools and policies and programs that uh, we can, uh, uh, the council can approve and, 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 you know, help shape how we're going forward in the municipality from a mobility perspective. But, you know, a lot of a lot of the factors 
that will influence how people travel uh, will depend on on provincial legislation and provincial policy de decisions. And uh, you know we have mechanisms to coordinate for that, but uh, it's it's you know it's just sort of something to think keep in mind as as we're looking at the future and and looking at if we're going to change how we move in the municipality, it has to involve all those jurisdictions kind of coordinating and collaborating on things like speed limits, road safety. And uh, and some of the decisions that are made about how we use the infrastructure that we've got. Great, thanks so much. Um, so it looks like we haven't received any additional questions. So I guess we can wrap things up. Um, next slide, please. So I just want to reiterate for everybody who is here uh, that you are welcome to continue this conversation uh, and submit any other questions or comments you may have uh, and participate in all of our engagement tools. On this slide, you can see our website, our email and our phone number, and we're happy to continue to speak with you if you have any questions or comments you'd like to submit. Uh, next slide, please. So I just want to thank everybody for attending and thank all of our panelists for their time today uh, and uh, have a great day. Thank you, everyone.